Ladies and gentlemen, now for something completely different and somewhat unscripted. It's time to get you involved. There are many tribes in intensive care, emergency medicine, and anesthesia. And we need a chance to ask tough questions. We need to not allow people to get away with too much, especially given the power that social media has now given people. Ladies and gentlemen, just as not everybody was really kung fu fighting, <laughs> people overstate things. And I think it's time we put my formerly dear friend <laughs> on the executioner's block. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen? You are a court of his peers. So you get to vote at the end, and there is a flat, flavorless cup of beer, which is an American he'll thoroughly enjoy. <laughs> Reuben, we can do this the easy way or the tough way. Why do they put erasers on pencils? Because people make mistakes, Reuben. <laughs> and so you can just simply say, I'm sorry, I overstated. Or we can do it the tougher way, and me and 2,500 people We'll take a piece out of you. Thank you, Peter. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't have that part scripted. <laughs> For every uh, complex problem, there's a simple answer. It's clear, it's simple, and it's wrong. Now, I don't know whether you're actually using ketamine yourself. Some of the sort of delusions of truth suggest you might be. Is it truly always the answer? Or was that hyperbole to make a point? I guess we'll find out. <laughs> Let me put it this way, my friend. Uh, while I was away, I got emails from my home hospital that there was no bicarbonate left in the hospital. If uh, we can have situations where there's no bicarbonate left over, we could certainly have no ketamine. So if you couldn't use ketamine, what would you use? If I couldn't use ketamine, what I would use for? Let's say procedural sedation. OK, there's lots of other good options, just none is good. <laughs> but if I can paraphrase, ketamine is not always the answer. <laughs> so <laughs> let's talk about procedural sedation. I've certainly given ketamine and watched the blood pressure plummet. I've certainly watched the patient dissociate from their ability to breathe. <laughs> that might say more about you than the patient. <laughs> I'm not on trial today, sir. Um, so let's talk. Procedural sedation, you've got your ketamine. What should people know? Because there is a danger with the power of social media that if we say ketamine's always the answer, there will be people that say, Reuben, mighty Strayer, said ketamine's always the answer. So what is needed to be known? Well, any time that anyone uses ketamine for any indication and there's a bad outcome, I get angry emails and tweets insinuating that I'm responsible. <laughs> I've gotten phone calls from strangers saying, I just gave ketamine to this guy and now he's not doing well. Those are actually all aliases and other email accounts mm -hmm. that I use. I'm not surprised. <laughs> Was there a question buried in there? <laughs> yes, what should people know? What are the cautions, the precautions around ketamine, pr procedural sedation? for severe agitation. Okay, for so for procedural sedation, we'll talk procedural sedation. 
Um, ketamine is a fantastic agent for procedural sedation. It uh, totally isolates the patient from external stimuli. There is no procedure too painful, too anxiety provoking, too psychologically damaging for ketamine. I'm wondering if I should have taken some prior to this interview. But, I'm certainly uh, high as a kite right now. Yeah. <laughs> but there are problems with, uh, with ketamine. Ketamine is not perfect. Uh, it's just the best agent that we have. So uh, anyone who gets ketamine and is dissociated can develop hypoventilation from a variety of mechanisms, uh, central apnea, laryngospasm, airway malpositioning secretions. And therefore, anytime there's a dissociated patient that's not intubated, there has to be an airway-capable provider. At, I mean, I don't know if you consider yourself in that, in that group. Uh, there has to be an airway-capable provider. That was comedy magic, at, by the way. Side, Keep going. <laughs> continuously monitoring the patient's ventilation. So that's the most important thing to think about when you're using ketamine for procedural sedation. There are other minor problems that develop with, with ketamine when you, uh, for procedural sedation, like recovery agitation, psychiatric distress, muscle rigidity, these can generally be managed pretty easily with uh, propofol. Fantastic. Let's talk about agitation. Because they're, it, I'm, I'm probably spoilt in the intensive care unit because we have the monitor. We always do, but not everybody does. And there's a huge range of agitation, all the way from that look you're giving me, to <laughs> severe bouncing off the wall. So does everybody get ketamine? Is ketamine always the answer? Right, so ketamine is definitely not always the answer for agitation, and uh, <laughs> although I might need some in a bit, <laughs> ketamine causes dissociation when you give it a dissociative dose, and that's the right dose for agitation. You don't want to give sub-dissociative doses for agitation. If you give a dissociative dose of ketamine to an agitated patient as like a tranquilizer, that patient is going to become dissociated. And that means that patient is, again, prone to hypoventilation, which means that an airway-capable provider has to be continuously monitoring ventilation for that patient, which is why ketamine is not the right drug for routine agitation. Ketamine is the right drug for the uncontrollably violent patient, which I'm, I'm getting there, uh, <laughs> because in that case, in that case, in the uncontrollably violent patient, the possible harms of ketamine, which are apnea, hypoventilation, are worth it because you want to take immediate control of the patient. You want to pivot from control to resuscitation. But in routine agitation, those harms are not worth it, so you're better off with a conventional sedative like droperidol or midazolam. So if I could paraphrase, ketamine is not always the answer. <laughs> ketamine is not always the answer. Ketamine is usually the answer. Could I even go further? Is it a case of ketamine if necessary, but not necessarily ketamine? <laughs> it just came to me. It sounded dead smart. <laughs> so, analgesia. Ketamine's been suggested in analgesia, and you and I both work in jurisdictions where there are awful near epidemic deaths from fentanyl overdoses and drugs like it. And so people have suggested, let's get away from this, but I, I, I worry that then ketamine, special K, will just flood our streets. Or that the same mentality as the NRA uses <laughs> will apply to this new agent. In other words, Bayer invented heroin to get people off morphine. Is this ketamine push for analgesia not more of the same? Well, I would welcome a replacement of all the opioid abuse with ketamine abuse, because then what you would see instead of 15-year-olds found dead in their bedroom is you'd see 15-year-olds running around playing with twirling lights. Okay, so that's, that sounds like a better gig. The problem with ketamine that you see with analgesia, unlike with opioids, if you push it too far, you get respiratory depression. You don't get respiratory depression with analgesic dose ketamine. The problems with ketamine for analgesia are that you get psychoperceptual effects. So if you give 10 milligrams ketamine to a normal-sized adult and you don't get enough effect, you might give another 10 milligrams. And then you push the patient from analgesic range into what I call recreational 
range ketamine, where some patients will start to feel stoned and maybe hallucinate. And most people do fine in that, uh, in that range. Indeed, ketamine is used recreationally for this purpose. But some people will not like, where'd you get that, that picture? It's good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's good. Isn't it? <laughs> Your mom posted it to me. Uh, <laughs> your mom jokes, really? We're doing mom jokes, uh, yeah. <laughs> doing mom jokes. Yeah. I'm She's pour no that joke, beer all over you. She's a uh, fiery woman. So anyway, <laughs> when, uh, when you push the dose high with ketamine, you can get psychoperceptual effects. Most people won't be bothered by them. Some people will love them. If some people don't like the psychoperceptual effects, if they don't like the walls throbbing, they don't like their hands disappearing, you can give a little bit of droperidol or mirtazolam, um, smooth things out, it's no big deal. Fantastic. Fantastic. Other circumstances, ketamine overdose, for example, presumably more ketamine. <laughs> Pediatrics, obstetrics, high ICP. We're nearing the end, I assure you. I'm as happy as you are. Um, what about those circumstances? Rapid fire. Uh, ketamine overdose doesn't, uh, there is no such thing really as ketamine overdose, it turns out. There is an elegant case series from 20 years ago where uh, this hospital was stocking multiple concentrations of ketamine and they gave some nine year old a 100 fold overdose in ketamine. And you know what happened to that nine year old? Nothing. He was dissociated for about 24 hours. <laughs> Did he grow up to be an emergency doctor somewhere in New York? Easy. <laughs> no, he moved to Canada. You come on, I gave you that cup. Uh, what about the combos? What about the combos? Ketamine and propofol, rocuronium and ketamine. I love this kind of stuff. I'm really into it. Okay. Combos and in what order? Uh, well, I can take ketamine and propofol. Um, Ketofol uh, makes great sense. It's a grand idea. Put ketamine and propofol in the same syringe. Their toxicities sort of counteract each other. Uh, and they play really nice together. It's a grand idea. It works very well. Except that it doesn't work any better than the agents given independently. So it also doesn't make sense to put them in the same syringe pharmacokinetically. Um, propofol wears off in seconds, like your attention span, and um, <laughs> ketamine accumulates. So when I do ketamine, uh, when I do ketamine procedural sedation, I, I use ketamine in dissociative doses, and I have propofol drawn up, ready to use for whatever adverse effect I might encounter. Fantastic. Fortunately, ketamine also has amnestic qualities. Um, droperidol. You talk about this all the time. You know, you can't get it. So, you know, let's, let's give, give people fairy dust as well, eh? <laughs> um, I can't get it, but uh, people in Germany can get it. And if you move to Australia, they put it in the drinking water, so... <laughs> They're going to vote in a second, you know, mm. most of them are mm. prisoners. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anything else about Joe Peridot? Because as we wrap this up, I want it to be clear to the audience how much I do admire the work you've done, the nuance that you've attacked the ketamine issue and the enthusiasm behind Joe Peridot. Should it be in North America? How do we get it in North America? Well, uh, last on year high. on this stage, I uh, launched a Kickstarter campaign for droperidol because uh, I want to build a droperidol manufacturing plant in North America where we can't make any droperidol. I estimated that we need about $500 million. So far, I've had commitments from, a good, friends, from good friends of about $250. So we're well on our way to uh, bringing droperidol back to North America, making droperidol great again. So it's... <laughs> <laughs> Presumably, droperidol will soon be the only answer. Over to you. Yes. 
<laughs> well, the audience are clearly fans of ketamine, so I have to say they were biased from the get-go. There were a couple of favourable comparisons to this and Glastonbury, so that's <laughs> a little bit of feedback for you, Peter. Uh, but I think probably one of the themes that came out was about being an advocate for something. What is your responsibility to make sure there is a balanced coverage? So when you, when you come out in favour of a particular agent or idea, you're at risk to ignore um, the competing evidence. Uh, so the first thing is to try it on yourself to make sure that you, uh, <laughs> you know all the adverse effects. And the second thing is to uh, make sure that you advise people to proceed with caution and be literature-based um, in their approach. I think we put it to the jury. I think we do. Can I also suggest he do a Kickstarter for a pair of socks? Like, what's going on there, mate? <laughs> okay, to the audience. Is ketamine always the answer? Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, You're guys. all deluded. Is ketamine not always the answer? I'm delighted to Thanks, say guys. Ruben wins. Cheers, guys.